Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the first webinar of 2021. Happy New Year to you all. I'm Sheila from the Philippines, and I hope that you are safe and well wherever you are. We have a very interesting topic today, which is executive decision making. And it, it teaches us the art of making the right decisions. We know that we've made, I have made a lot of poor decisions in my life, and we probably need this in this um, very uncertain times. And I welcome you all on behalf of the international leadership team. And before we start with the, pro with the webinar proper, I would like to welcome Sean, who would like to give us a message for tonight. Thank you, Sheila. Happy New Year for 2021 to you and to our neurosemantic community. So may your new year be the year that you refresh your dreams. So hello, my name is Sean Dwyer, the International Medicoach President, and I'd like you to imagine a brand new world where you connect with your friends again. Imagine a brand new world where you achieve your deepest dreams. Imagine a brand new world. You achieve your self-actualizing highest potentials. Imagine a brand new world. You see only sparkling beauty in other people's eyes and you feel the excitement from face-to-face -face trainings and coachings again. Imagine in a brand new world where you hear sounds of more empowering callback songs and laughter of those in your presence. Imagine a brand new world where you provide more training, coaching services. Imagine in a brand new world where hotspots are vaccinated and people can live without fear of the pandemia. Imagine a brand new world. Your new normal allows you to be more of who you wish to become. Imagine a brand new world for 2021 and welcome to Executive Decisions. I hope you really enjoy today's community webinar with our neurosemantic community. So thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Sean, for that a very inspiring message. And I can't imagine myself being in a whole new world where there's no distancing that's needed. And next, I would like to welcome David, our president of the ISNS, to give us a message as well. Hi, David. Hi, Sheila. Thank you. Thank you for your welcome. And thank you, Sean, for your uh, very inspiring words, for uh, helping us to imagine the world that we want, the 2020 that we want, 21, sorry, that we want. So uh, I just want to say that something that uh, all of us, we know, 2020 has been a tough year for most of us, perhaps especially for trainers. Of course, some of us, uh, for some, has been harder, for others, a uh, little bit less. But at the end, it's a, it was a very atypic year. So we are starting a new year, and this means new opportunities. So more than just wishing you a very good 2021, I want to remind you the very foundation of neurosemantics. We don't have any control of what happens in the world. We don't have any control about what the pandemic and all the international decisions that regulate our countries around the pandemic. But the only thing that we can control is our way to respond to what happens in the world. You own your own meanings, you own your meanings, and that means that you own your responses. So my wish is uh, for you to create the best meanings for this new year. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, for reminding us of our in control of our thoughts and our feelings. And we are also in charge and totally in control of the decision that we make. And before we start, I just want to remind everyone to please be on mute for the entire time unless you're going to ask a question. And if you do have a question about the talk, please write on the chat box and write the word question before you type your question so it will be easier for us to filter. And without further ado, I would like to welcome Jason Snyder, who will be moderating tonight's discussion. And of course, I would like to welcome the director and reason for everyone of us to be here 
together, Michael Hall and Geraldine Hall. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Um, as I kind of scroll through uh, all the faces here, it's just so nice to see so many people that I've met before in the past and some of the people that I hope to meet in the near future as we get back out into our training and, and normal training environment and normal training schedule. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today to uh, moderate this conversation with Michael. Uh, I imagine that over the past couple of months, he's read quite a few books on decisions before writing his own book on decision making. And so I think we have a great opportunity here to get inside of his mind and learn how we can apply better decisions in our lives uh, personally as well as professionally. So thank you, Michael, and welcome. Thank you, Jason. <clears throat> when it comes to decisions, <clears throat> decisions have brought you to where you are in your life. So wherever you are in your life, whatever circumstances you're facing, decisions brought you there. The decisions you made or the decisions you failed to make. And so decision shapes our lives. The decisions you make uh, formulates your future. And with sometimes a single decision, you can utterly transform your life, your future, your destiny. Pretty powerful thing, decision. So the question is, uh, what is a decision? What is the psychology of decision? And what I'd like to begin with is just to share some facts about decision that um, are, are, are pretty amazing. First of all, um, decision affects everything. You decide uh, what to do. That's the most obvious. I'm going to do this or that. You decide who to be, your identity. You decide who to be with. You decide how to be with the persons you're with. You decide on how to think. You decide on what to believe. You decide on what to value. You decide on how to use time what career to pursue, what problems to solve, what problems to ignore, uh, how to solve problems. You decide on what to create, what to innovate. The list just goes on and on and on and on. Decision for us human beings is what navigates today, tomorrow, and the future. So... When it comes to decision, it, it seems so pervasive and it seems so obvious. The problem with decisions, though, is that though they seem simple, they are exceedingly complex. Now, the word decision, decision, to cut and to cut off, ends up in the yes-no response. So, yes, I'm going to do that. No, I'm not going to do that. Yes, I'm going to read that. No, I'm not going to read that. It seems so simple. Um, but the complexity is very deep because in order to make a, a true decision, to make a true decision, you have to do a lot of thinking, choosing your values, your criteria, your standards by which you make that decision. The thinking is about content. It's about beliefs. It's about pros and cons. It's about weighing and comparing um, how things go. And so when it comes to a decision, it seems like it's a primary state. Yes, I'm going to do that. No, I'm not going to do that. And yet it's a very complex layered meta state and and that's why children do not make decisions and cannot make a true decision until puberty or so when they are able to do abstract thinking when it's just concrete thinking we generally default to either circumstance emotion or other people and so we're not making decisions. 
we're defaulting to the circumstances. And, and so if you listen to children, you made me, he made me, it made me, they're not making decisions, they're just defaulting to a circumstance. Or they default to emotion. I felt, I wanted, I, I hated, I couldn't stand. So the emotion, they just reacted. They didn't make a decision, they reacted. Um, or default to other people. What should I do? Where should I go? What should I wear? Um, and so we default to other people. Everybody else is doing it. So true decision is an adult experience that requires quite a few years of, of, of preparation, of getting ready to actually think through something and make up your mind about something. And now you're ready and you're at the place of making a decision. Right, so, so you say there that um, children uh, don't have the option to decide, but it's super, it's interesting to me, I think when you go through the list of all the things we decide, we choose our job, we choose our relationships, I think as adults, a lot of us don't actually actively choose those things either. Yes, and that's going to be the problem, um, another problem of decision. Not, not only are decisions um, deceptively simple in structure and yet complex in actual nature, but uh, in the psychology of decisions, we all make poor decisions. It, it's our nature. It's, our, it's, it's what, who we are as human beings. It takes a long time to make smart decisions, intelligent decisions, and so by nature we make poor decisions. And I think every one of us could start making quite an extensive list of the poor decisions that we've made over our lives. It's the most natural thing. It's the norm to make poor decisions. And yet poor decisions mm -hmm. is what undermines life the quality of life, um, your enjoyment of life, because um, now we have regrets and we're working on trying to undo the decisions that we've made. Um, and so poor decisions is the norm and defaulting on decision making is also the norm. Mm -hmm. So here, here's three problems of decisions. First of all, the they're deceptively simple, hiding complexity. Secondly, um, poor deciding is the norm. So we, we have to fight against that and resist that. Third, defaulting on decision making is also the norm. So it's the norm for us to default our decisions to the world and to other people. It sounds like kind of the opposite of, of responsibility, kind of where we started with David talking about owning our responses. If we're defaulting our decision making, it sounds like we're, we're actually giving away our power in a sense. Is that, is that correct? Exactly. Which is why a lot of people um, have such a hard time with the first pattern that we do in APG, in neural semantics, and that is owning your power. Because they have spent a lifetime not taking ownership of, of those powers by which they can make decisions. And I could imagine that there would be some limiting frames there that could potentially show up. If I was to own my decisions, then uh, all, all of the implications of that to somebody who has been defaulting their decisions prior to that. Yeah. That, that is, in, in the first problem, uh, the decisions are deceptively simple. Inside of decision is a real opportunity to be, to be afraid. The fear of making a decision. Because now I have to live with it. Now I have to be responsible for it and accountable to what I decided to think or believe or choose or do. 
So it sounds like decision making is very intricate. Like, a, from what I'm hearing from you, is that decision making is very related with self actualization. That more self actualizing people would probably be more responsible for making more thought through, well thought through decisions. Well, uh, yes, I hadn't even thought about that. But Abraham Maslow said that the first step in self actualization is choosing. Mm. The is first deciding. step of self actualization is deciding. Yeah. So the fear of deciding is why a lot of people will not and refuse, absolutely refuse, which is a decision, absolutely refuse to make a New Year's resolution. Fear of deciding. What's the fear? Well, the fear is I'm accountable, I'm responsible, I can't hold my emotions, my circumstances or other people accountable. But also, now I have to live the decision. Hmm. So, and what's, what do you think is the fear behind that? So if, if I had to live my decision, then what, what's the implications of that? Well, commitment. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so inside of the complexity of deciding is that we live decisions. If I decide I'm going to move to a city, the decision then becomes where I live. If I decide to take a job, then showing up, to work each day at that place is how I live the decision. If I decide to quit smoking, then, so decisions are lived. And that's what makes them scary. Because it's not just a thought with no consequences. To, to decide is to cut off these options, cut off these options, saying no to good things and saying yes to a great thing. And so part of, the, part of the, the complexity of a decision is that when you decide you're committing yourself from this day forward, I will do this, think this, feel this, whatever the decision is. So it's my sense that a lot of people make decisions but aren't they aren't really decisions like they, they'll say from this day if it's new year's and from this day forward i'm going to you know exercise every day in the morning but but then um they, they it seems like it's a decision but so what 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 is yeah. the what, what gives there yeah so now you've made the distinction between a real decision mm. and a pseudo decision mm. and how many of us have made many many pseudo decisions. People who make New Year's resolutions, but they really didn't do not follow through and do not let the commitment lead them to live that decision. They end up making a pseudo decision. And then that weakens their willpower. It weakens their intentionality. So that as they reflect back on it, New Year's decisions, uh, resolutions don't work. I don't like making decisions. I don't like setting goals. And so now they undermine their own resourcefulness, their own power by their pseudo decisions. So, so making pseudo decisions or these, these um, loose commitments can actually weaken our intentionality and, and in the long run weaken our decision-making power. Yeah. With our reflexivity, as we think about um, how, how, how I make a decision and live it, if I don't do it well, then I start questioning myself, doubting myself, undermines confidence, has lots of negative consequences for a pseudo decision. And yet how easy it is and how tempting it is, will you do this? Yes, I'll do it. When... <laughs> We haven't thought it through. We haven't really committed. We're just getting someone off our back by saying we're going to do something. And it seems like a decision, sounds like a decision, but it's not. So we have a question here in the chat um, that, um, let me see who this is from, from uh, Wilhelm. And he's asking, so we build our conscious decisions 
on the decisions that we made as children that perhaps we're unconscious of now. Is that statement valid? And would there then be value in um, helping someone become conscious of their former unconscious decisions? <laughs> well, the, deci the decisions of childhood are not real decisions. I mean, that's the first thing. Um, uh, you know, we, we talk to children, what do you want to be when you grow up? And all kinds of wonderful and imaginative things occur. Uh, but children really do not uh, make a decision. From, from neurology and neurosciences, the part of our brain that makes decisions is the frontal lobes. So the prefrontal lobes is where we, we plan, we decide, we choose, we uh, think through things. It's that executive decision-making area of the brain, which is not literally, it's not developed until puberty. Puberty is when certain brain chemicals uh, com com begin to complete the development of the prefrontal lobes. So whatever decisions you've made as a child, first of all, they weren't real decisions. Um, and, and so that's why uh, in puberty and thereafter, um, owning our power to think, to feel, to speak, to do, owning that, embracing it, um, is a high-level meta-state that we call responsibility. And it, it takes some development to do that. Uh, children can learn to do taking some responsibility mm -hmm. by uh, behavioral uh, reward and enforcement. But to really think it through and make an executive decision, that comes later. So as children, we don't even have the, the uh, for lack of a better word, the hardware to, to make well thought through decisions. Right. Right. So during childhood, we, we all do three things. We default to circumstances, emotions, and others. Mm -hmm. So three things that most of us have to get over when we become adults is to stop deferring to the world makes me and to say, I am responding and choosing to respond. We have to get over uh, just reacting on our emotions. Well, I felt like it. I wanted to. So when I've worked with uh, young teenagers who were uh, convicted of, uh, <laughs> uh, of violence um, and anger control problems, the problem was always, but I felt it. And if I feel it, I have to do it, <clears throat> which is really an animalistic, <laughs> not a humanistic, an animalistic way <laughs> of responding. And it's, it's just reaction. Getting us adults to take a breath, step back, claim a meta moment to reflect on our emotions. Should I act on this? Should I not act on this? Should I just put this on hold? Should I act on this in this particular way so that it'll serve my relationships? It'll, it'll be ecological for me. That's a pretty adult thing uh, for teenagers and adults uh, to develop, which is essential if you're going to make executive decisions. All right. So it sounds like making executive decisions is a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe that's why a lot of people are, are defaulting. <laughs> Another reason. <laughs> it's a lot of cognitive effort. Mm. Because when I decide, let's say I'm going to decide on where to move, and I've got two or three options. I've, it's a lot of cognitive effort to think my values, my context, my relationships, all the variables, all the factors that's going to play into this, and the consequences. Here's another reason children do not... Uh, are not able to make a real decision, they do not think consequently. Thinking consequently, which is part of the prefrontal lobes to anticipate the future, is, is something that develops 
in puberty and thereafter to actually do consequential thinking. As adults and as parents, we try to help our children when they're eight or nine, think about what's going to happen if you do this. And of course, trying to get them to do that um, until, until puberty, they really cannot think it through, which is part of decision making. So we have a question here from Francisco wondering, so how do we help someone? Let's say we have a coaching client who's having a hard time making decisions or they make pseudo decisions or they're insecure about past decisions. Um, what, could you, what could you give us today that would okay. help us to better coach someone who's in that situation? Okay, I'm, I'm gonna hold that off for just a moment because I wanna get to that. Mm -hmm. But before we get to that, there's, there's a few other things to say about decision-making to understand really what's involved in, in decision-making. So, so I'll do that first and then I'll come back uh, to that. Um, when it comes to decisions, here's another mm -hmm. factor that is part of the simple uh, deceptiveness of pseudo decisions. Decisions accumulate. Every day, every one of us probably makes 100, 200, maybe 500 decisions. What to wear, what to eat, where to go, what to say. We make hundreds of decisions. And these everyday decisions, most of them uh, seem innocuous. Like, it doesn't make that much difference. Um, and so the decisions we make throughout the day, driving to work and listening to the radio, talking, most of them seem um, uh, inconsequential. But here's the thing about decisions. Decisions accumulate. And this may be the, the first question also about, um, from Willem about childhood decisions. We make decisions and and then we build on decisions and build on decisions and we make deci the same decision over and over and over and over. So if I keep defaulting to my emotions and I don't feel like exercising day after day after, and so every day, well, I'm going to exercise, but I don't feel like it today. It starts accumulating. What then happens with anything that is regular and and patterned is that it becomes a pattern. It becomes an unconscious response pattern, and it now works on automatic so that, so that decisions hide in our patterns. So one way to find patterns or decisions to detect old decisions that don't serve us well is to look at our automatic uh, patterned responses to things. Mm. How do you typically respond mm -hmm. to criticism? How do you typically respond to uh, bad news? How do you typically respond to um, uh, a lot of chocolates or pastries? So decisions accumulate and build up into these habits, and then it can become um, a lot of cognitive uh, uh, awareness and choice to break those old habits that decisions have accumulated in. So, so that's another place where decisions hide. So decisions are hiding in our patterns, our automatic patterns. And sometimes we make these little decisions or they seem inconsequential, but over time we're, we're habituating responses that, that, pro that may not serve us well. Yeah, and if we want to find the decision, let's look at the look at the look at the game. If you, it sounds to me like uh, every frame has a game, well, every game has a, a frame driving it. All right. So this goes to now maybe where a decision had been made. Um, it wasn't a real decision, but it was a decision of some level. I hate studying. A, a, a fifth grader may make. I hate school. I hate studying. And then it, it starts to accumulate. And while it wasn't a thought out real decision, um, it became a 
concrete decision in that person's mind. This is what the NLP pattern, decision destroyer, is designed to do. To go back to the first time you made some stupid decision. You know, uh, people will only like me if I look rich. So I'll wear brand name clothes, then they'll like me. Some stupid decision like that, that, that accumulated and that got reinforced behaviorally. And so we go back to the first place and we use the decision destroyer pattern. And so that's one way to start changing um, old decisions that have gotten locked in and has become lifestyle. So we can go back using this pattern from the, uh, the decision destroyer pattern would be an example of a way to go back and maybe before it was even a decision, you went at a time you made a, an unconscious response and then it solidified over time. We can go back using timeline processes and, and straighten that out. Yeah. So um, in, in terms of how to make a truly uh, executive decision, we're, we're talking about a decision that is thought out, one that fits values, criteria, standards, one that is significant and meaningful to you, one in which you have contextualized it so that it fits the context, the ecology of your life, relationships, health, finance, whatever. And so, so when we make that kind of decision, uh, usually it involves planning. That is anticipating and creating a strategy. So here, here now is another NLP um, intervention that you can use with helping someone make great decisions. What's your strategy for? Let's say, let's say you have a setback. Let's say that the pandemic of 2020 caused some ec economic setbacks. What's your plan for resilience? So as you think through what resilience is, then the question of how to do it is your planning. And the planning is a strategy. Inside that strategy, you'll need several states from which to be functioning. And, and inside of all of that strategy, you'll also need some contingency planning. So part of decision-making, it's just integrated. It's the backside of the same thing. Planning, strategizing, uh, contingency planning, risk management, and so what you brought up earlier, it's a lot of work. It's certainly a lot of cognitive effort. Hmm. So decision-making also involves a strategy for how we decide. And also what I'm hearing from you is that we have um, to think through the, the like uh, all of the, some contingency plans. So when we make a decision, what happens if this happens? What happens if that? So, so then when we're making decisions, we're, we're building kind of a rich possibility map of the future. Is that a way of explaining it? Like thinking through all of the possibilities or as many as we can as human beings and try to cover as many bases as possible? Right. So there's that overall decision. I'm going to become highly resilient as a person and not let a setback set me back. I'm going to bounce back with resilience. Then there's multiple smaller decisions inside that big decision. And so from a meta state perspective, there's the large frame of, de of the big decision and then all the smaller decisions inside the strategy that moves along. And this is what makes decision making, executive decision making complex. So could you define that for us? How would you define executive decision making? So an executive decision-making is really a decision that's going to be governing and informing and managing all of the decisions that have to be made. So just like an executive in an organization makes a decision um, and, and sets a policy for something, uh, you can't leave it there. You then have to follow up with the senior managers, the junior managers. How does it get implemented? So 
So executive decision making is making decisions that get implemented. Is that fair yeah. to say? So in terms of the stages of decision making, uh, we can divide it into three stages, preparing, initiating, concluding. So preparing. So in preparing, there's two stages. There's framing and there's information gathering. So when it comes to a significant decision, what job to take, who to marry, uh, where to move, um, how, to, how to set up my, my health and fitness program, um, uh, developing my professional um, career, the preparation is framing and information gathering. So framing is where you establish your presuppositions, <laughs> your premises, and, and you begin framing the why and the intention uh, for what you're going to do. That governs the information gathering. What information do I need? How much information do I need? Information from whom? Information about the context, about the options, and just on and on. Information gathering. So if I'm, let's say I'm, I'm thinking through about buying a car. So what would be an example of some framing that I could do to um, prepare myself for information gathering? So the first framing would be around your intention. So the why, why is it important to buy a new car or a, a new car to you? So uh, the, finding your intention. Um, if you don't operate intentionally, then you'll be operating attentionally, and that means you're giving power to circumstances, other people, and emotions. So first framing is intention. What's my intention? Um, another framing is uh, buying, a, buying a car. Uh, the design mm -hmm. is, is to achieve what? If it, to status, uh, economy, um, travel, um, sustainability of the vehicle. So setting up the design of the choice. If we don't frame it and prepare it, then we will be much more likely to be persuaded, influenced, manipulated by other people and circumstances. That makes a lot of sense. So thinking through what is our intention, what do we want for whatever our decision is to get clear on that before we start gathering information. So this is where the well-formed outcome becomes a, a critical piece in helping someone make good decisions. The 18 questions of the well-formed outcome. Then there's the information gathering and how long will that take? So, Every time I write a book, um, that's part of the decision and the framing. Um, what information do I gather? From whom? How long do I do that? How many books will I read in order to have a good understanding of a discipline so that I'm ready to write? Um, so the information gathering will be about the facts that you want to achieve and doing critical thinking about the facts, the variables, uh, the context. So information gathering. Um, a lot of people, because it's a lot of cognitive effort, uh, skip this stage and hope that by um, coincidence, they'll have the right information. And later on, after they've made a decision and the decision went awry, they'll go, what was I thinking? And of course, the answer is, I wasn't. I wasn't really thinking through the information and the quality of that information. So that's, that's preparation stage of decision making. Yeah, I, I think in that situation there, just to, to make a comment from my own personal experience, in that situation, sometimes what happens uh, in my life is that I'll, I'll get uh, overwhelmed by all the information. So there's just so much information, oh, yeah, and, I, and I default to not making a decision. So that, that could happen, I think, quite a few times. Yeah. Another problem. 
Yeah. So when we get overwhelmed with the decision, it, that really takes us back to framing. What information do I need? What information is relevant? What information is not? Mm -hmm. And so you set up your frames for that. Right now, I'm studying metaphor. That'll be the next book, metaphor. Mm -hmm. And in, set, in, in setting up the framing, and, and these stages are, are not sequential and that in, in the sense that when you're done with this stage, uh, you never go back to it. As I gather information, I realize uh, another frame to set. Because there's a lot of stuff I'm reading about metaphor that has nothing to do with what I want to write about or say. So it sends me back to here's another framing because this information is irrelevant. And this information is relevant. So in that preparation stage, framing and information gathering, you're, you're back and forth constantly. And it, it, to me, it sounds like there's maybe a bit of a, an active meta program there because maybe, or, or maybe some optimization of a meta program. So if I need to have all the framings right before I go and gather information, uh, then I'm never going to get to that stage. Yeah. So, Exactly. Yeah. The next stage of decision making is initiating. Initiating. So you got all this information. Now we need to uh, identify several, several things. First of all, my initial understanding. Here's where I am right now as I think about this decision. Here are my values. Here's what's really important, and here's the prioritizing of it. Um, diagnosing um, whatever the situation is so that you have a good diagnosis of the situation and where you want to go with it. And then separating knowledge between primary knowledge and meta-knowledge. So that's, that's the, the beginning place. I do that when I write a book by writing out the first draft. The first draft is my initial understanding of something. And then as I read that first draft the second time, I'm looking for, um, does this, uh, what are the values that I'm presenting or assuming or working with? What's important? Um, I'm also looking at uh, the level of knowledge, uh, the primary level of knowledge, and then the meta knowledge about it, knowledge about knowledge. And those will be the, the principles or the rules or the heuristics. And so being able to understand that, if we apply that to resilience, at the primary level is what do you have to do to bounce back? What do you have to do? What state do you need to be in? That's primary knowledge. Meta knowledge is uh, how many stages are there? Where, what stage am I at right now? As I step back and reflect, um, where am I? So that would be meta knowledge of how resilience works. One piece of meta knowledge would be um, making sure that I'm not uh, personalizing making it permanent, making it pervasive. So that becomes meta-knowledge about any particular step. Um, and so, so when we initiate a decision, um, this is the first information we're working with. And as we do that, the next part of the second stage is testing. And once again, we're back and forth, testing and then cleaning up the information, testing, cleaning up the information, checking on cognitive biases, checking on cognitive distortions, checking on cognitive fallacies. So the quality of thinking is the quality of the information I'm working with. Here, here with the testing, um, it's so important to be skeptical. What if I'm wrong? What if I don't have the right information? And so using skepticism for critical thinking as I work through the information, if I don't do that, then I can get caught up in uh, the confirmation bias, 
I'm, I'm just confirming what I want to be true. And then I just, I only get information that supports what I already believe. So I'm really not open to new information um, or the availability bias. I'm just operating on what's available. And so this is where the decision making, whether it's individual or a group, having someone play devil's advocate with us to, to really test the quality of the information. The quality of the decision is a function of the quality of the information. Mm. So the quality of the decision is a function of the quality of the information. And that's why it's so important to bring in a skeptic's attitude or just have somebody to look for what, what am I not seeing? What could be wrong with what I'm already thinking to go against that availability bias and that confirmation yeah. bias. And, and when you're talking about action here, are you talking about acting upon the decision that you've made or are we still in planning to make the decision? Yeah. Right. So this sounds like to me kind of like if we're going down the well-formed outcome funnel, we're getting to the, the, the how part. Is that, would that be fair to say? Yes. Uh -huh. So to go back to buying a car, you go into a car uh, um, lot and a salesman is working with you. And um, the worst thing is to feel pressured. This deal will last till five o'clock this evening. If you don't buy and you don't choose by five o'clock, it'll be gone. And of course, what they're doing is preventing us from going home, talking about it, getting someone else's opinion, um, reading about the quality of the car. And so um, building in some room to think about it mm. instead of just reacting um, automatically as part of executive um, decision making. So that, that's an interesting point. So now, you know, what I'm, what I'm thinking of here is that there's lots of people out there, like everybody but you, for example, who could be trying to go against you making good decisions. All the salespeople and the marketers and the advertisers and the politicians and the media, everyone, you know, there's, there's lots of vested interests in other people potentially not having us make these yeah. executive decisions. One of the quotations I put in the book was from a famous CEO who, when everybody on the team unanimously decided, let's do this, and, and he said, is there anybody with any objection? And said, no. He said, well, we're not ready to make the decision <laughs> because of groupthink, which is another cognitive bias. Um, it's, it's too easy to be caught up into that mob mentality that – Everybody is saying it or doing it. So that's stage two. First is preparation, which is framing and, and information gathering. Stage two is initiating, which is um, working over the information with, with testing. The third stage of decision making is the concluding stage. Now we make the decision. So everything up till now has been facilitating the decision, and now we decide, we set our plan in motion, we organize what we're going to do, when we're going to do it, the strategy, and we have our contingency plans in place. And so, um, the, 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 as we go into concluding, we now bring it to a conclusion, and make sure that all the pieces are there, and that leads to implementation. So um, concluding, implementing, which is the action stage, and then the seventh one is feedback. We, we keep track of how's it going and what adjustments do we keep making given the feedback as to, and, and so, so we're test we're we're again testing it with the feedback and refining it as we go. So decision making. So first of all, all of this is before we've made the decision, and then finally we make that decision, and and now there's still ongoing deciding going on. Yeah. So, with a big decision, you can make provisional decisions. Mm. 
Um, I, I did that uh, actually with a book on decision making, because when I started, I did not know if I wanted to actually write the book. I figured I'll do the study. And if it looks like there's something I can contribute that's going to be unique from the neural semantic or the NLP perspective, then I'll do it. So my initial decision was provisional. I will do it if. Mm -hmm. So many times um, a decision will be like that. When I created the meta program uh, board game, um, I did all, all the initial framing and information gathering, all the structuring and, and testing, and then the planning and, and sequencing. And, and then, I, then I realized at this point, um, I needed to make a provisional decision. So I decided to make four games and test it. So I, I created, went to Hobby Lobby, cr created four games uh, board games and all the pieces and then I tested it out in some groups and then that brought brought it back to the final decision shall I do it because at that point the cost was something like thirty thousand dollars and do I do I make that investment so now we're relating decision making potentially with creativity and innovation and innovating something and the decisions that go through in, in actually innovating a, a product or a service well, and, and I would say every decision leads to innovation. Mm. Every decision leads to creation because you're creating your life. You're creating your lifestyle. Even if you decide to start doing Pilates or start running, uh, you're creating and then you're innovating. <laughs> so given the stages, the uh, the three primary stages and the seven detail stages of decision making for individuals and groups, you can see how complex a real decision is. Jason, are you there? <laughs> yeah, I'm processing. I'm trying to decide if I've ever made any real decisions before in the past or if I've just defaulted all along. <laughs> so, yeah, there's a lot going on here in terms of the how to make decisions here and, and, um, and, and walking through this, this, this process, um, you know, mapped out. There, there is a structure to decision making, though, is what I'm hearing, that it's not just willy-nilly, go with your gut, and trust your intuition, but there's an actual structure to how to make well thought through, well, well, well formed decisions. Yeah. So to the Meta Coaches E Group, um, maybe two months ago, I sent out a well formed decision uh, set of questions. I used the same 18 questions, but it completely different um, for a well formed decision. So all the Meta Coaches, you got that like two months ago uh, on the list. And, and it, it starts with deciding on the subject, getting the context, then the required actions that you're actually going to do, and then the capacity, the power to do those things, and then the process, the how, and then the resources that support the decision, and then the concluding so that you bring it to a good conclusion so that now it becomes lifestyle and you've got your indicators as to what demonstrates that in life. So Francisco is, 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 is dancing in his chair to know, how do we apply this with our coaching clients? Can we know that yet? <laughs> how do we work with someone who's, who's indecisive or, or regretting poor decisions from the past? Okay, so now you brought up a, another issue and that is, what are all the problems of decision-making? It could be indecisive. So some people are indecisive, which probably goes back to commitment. They're, they're afraid of the commitment and the actual doing that, being held accountable. Some people uh, have so many options that they, they can't say no to good things. So they can say yes to a great thing. 
So they have to address that. Some people have some old decisions that they've made that need to be uh, eliminated, broken up, and so the destroy decision destroyer. Some people just don't know how to do the process, so they need to learn how to do the process. So the question becomes, what is your problem in decision making? Um, uh, where do you get stuck in decision making? It, it could be an identity issue. I'm not a decisive person. So decision making. It could be values. I don't know what's really important. Um, I haven't really clarified my values and my intentionality. So the first thing in coaching would be uh, to identify where a person has problems in executive decision making. So looking for the outcome would be making better decisions or making executive decisions and looking for what are the interferences for that individual uh, going through the list of things that you just went through there and coaching, coaching to the interferences. So we've got quite a few questions here in the chat. I mean, they've just been pumping in, pumping in. Let me see if I can just pop out a couple of those before we, we give you the opportunity to say whatever final words you want to say. Is that all right with you, Michael? Sure. So we've got here, um, so uh, Gyro is asking, what about intuition on taking on decisions? Yeah, intuition is a, a, a false thing completely. Um, uh, if it's true in intuition, it, you took 10 years to develop it in a context that was dependable. This is what Dan O'Reilly in the book, Fast, uh, 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 Rational Irrationality said, and this is what Kinnaman in the book, Fast Thinking, Slow Thinking said, intuition is only valid in a context that's dependable, regular, systematic, that you can develop those intuitions over 10 years at least. Otherwise, it's just emotion. Otherwise, it's an urge. Otherwise, you're, you're defaulting to, to something that's not going to be sustainable. Uh, it's just a false thing. So people who default um, to emotions a lot of times call it intuition, and they make some really bad decisions. <laughs> So um, we've got a question here. So how, it sounds a lot, we have a couple of people saying that this sounds a lot like the axes of change. Um, so yeah, what would you say about that? Well, yes and no. The axis of change picks out a frame that has put you into a state, either toward or away from, and, and you're, 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 you're trying to get motivated uh, um, but it's, it's, it's not sufficient. And so you find that frame and then you make a decision um, that's going to ch change the thing that needs to change. And so then we go through the pros and the cons and, and the values. And so that's one little piece of decision-making. Um, it's just one piece. Um, it works with some information gathering, some testing, but, um, uh, but very little. Uh, when you go to the creation axes, then you start creating the how-to, and it picks up more of it. Um, so it's in there a little bit, um, but decision, executive decision-making involves so much more than what's in the axis of change. So the, the weighing the pros and cons, the decision axes is part of the executive decision yeah. process. Yeah. So let's see here. Um, sometimes even if you are implementing, you make decisions, what do you call these decisions? I'm not quite sure on that one there. Rasha, if you wanna specify. Sometimes even if you are implementing, you make decisions. What do you call these decisions? Well, so once again, you, you've got your larger frame. Um, this is my decision. To make that decision come true, I've got to do this and this and this and this and lots of smaller decisions. And inside those smaller decisions are decisions. 
decisions all the so, way down. <laughs> yeah. So let's say you made a decision, you're going to go and see the Grand Canyon. So then there's decision um, time, when I'm going to do this, who I'm going to go with, uh, what am I going to do when I'm there, how much money will it cost? Underneath there, under time, how to get there, will I fly, will I drive? And then as you're driving, you're making lots of decisions. Do I stop for gas? Do I stop to eat? So, so it's a hierarchy of, of decisions. The, the smaller decisions in service of the larger, the higher decisions. So this is actually an interesting one here from Sheila saying that, um, so decision is the, in, is the intent to act. As we are not in control of the outcome, then there are no good or bad decisions. Uh, could it mean that we have decided to be unresourceful in dealing with an outcome that does not meet our expectations? It's a bit convoluted, perhaps. Um, <laughs> well, what, what I'm pulling from that is I'm hearing that our decisions are, um, our decisions are, since we're not in control of the outcomes, then is there such thing as a good decision or a bad decision? I'm hearing here, like, there's no such thing as failure, only feedback sort of uh, thing. Well, yes, on that on the last one, and that's why the last stage of decision making is feedback. So how's it going? What's working? What's not working so well? What resource are you using? What resource do you need to start using? And so then the feedback loop at the end, uh, because with decisions, you live them. So let's, let's say you made a decision to exercise four times a week. You're going to go to the gym, you're going to exercise four times a week. So as you're doing that, you're getting feedback. And the feedback at any given day may be, I need to do more cardio, I need to do more stretching, need to do more weightlifting, need to use heavier weights, need to use lighter weights. So all of these ongoing decisions is the feedback to how I'm doing, and what are my goals? So opening up to so, so opening up the feedback loop in order to continue to inform your prior decision to continue to refine is that is that fair that in the feedback stage that you're refining your your initial decision? Exactly. So you're refining it so that it's more livable. Mm. Here's a good coaching question. Is the decision you've made livable? Are you living it? Is it enjoyable? Is it increasing the quality of life? Is it livable? And if not, then we need that refinement. So is, is your decision livable? Would you like to live by that decision? I think that's one of the questions from the mind to muscle process is, would you like to live by this decision? Right. So uh, a misunderstanding of a decision is that you decide and that's it. It's over. It's done. But it's, decisions are not like that. You live your decision. So if you've decided to be married to someone and, and you're married to someone, then you're living the decision. <laughs> now, you can always re-decide. If you decided to exercise and something happens and you're, you, you're hurt or you've got an injury, then redeciding is I'm going to stop exercising for a week or two. So, there, so it's, it's an ongoing living thing mm. and, and not just a, a, at a stop. And I remember from reading through the, uh, the executive decisions manual that some decisions, I mean, this is in the, the preparation phase, I believe, that some decisions are easily changeable and some of them aren't. If I'm going to get a tattoo, it's different than if I'm going to get a face painting. <laughs> <laughs> well, that brings up the consequences of decisions. Sometimes uh, if you go rob someone, if you get a gun and go rob a store and get arrested, and get convicted, you're, you're going to be living that decision in a jail. <laughs> and no matter how much you go, I'm sorry that I did that, <laughs> you're still going to live out that decision uh, until the term is settled. <laughs> so uh, sometimes we have to live with consequences. 
And that also is one of the fear of making decisions. People are afraid of consequences. And while we can't predict the future, we, we can create a higher probability. And that's where contingency planning helps to uh, think through, if something goes wrong, here's what I'm going to do. Plan B, plan C. So there's a, it sounds like a strat strategic thinking in a way, kind of thinking through ahead, what are the possibilities and how can I prepare for all the contingencies that are coming up? Sterling has a great question here. So, so, so we've got this well-formed decision process. You've got these three stages or the seven steps across those stages. And, and so we can do that with major decisions, but within that you're saying there are sub-decisions and decisions within the decision. So how, how, how much time should we be spending on some of these, let's say smaller decisions that are informing, the, how, how does that all fit together in terms of time in your real life applications? Well, a great coaching question for, for every one of us would be, any decision I make, no matter how small, that is a decision in service of what? Mm. So let's say I get upset with someone and curse at them. That decision to curse is in service of, and hopefully <laughs> that'll, that'll expose that, that that was a poor decision. Mm. And it was a tiny one, a little one, but um, it, it, it now is like a cancer inside of a larger decision, working against it. So the smallest things you do every day, it, it is in service of what? And that's in service of what? And this helps us to check the quality and the ecology of decisions. So this sounds kind of like exploring the, the decision beyond the decision or the positive intention behind the decision. This is kind of like the facet, the decision facet of the mind and exploring in its environment, does this yeah. do service to its, its positive intention or what its, its meta decision? Suppose you have a client who constantly cannot achieve the goals that he sets out. So asking the question, what stops you? And, and as we find out what stops him, it might be he keeps letting himself off the hook. Well, this one time, um, these brownies look so good. These, this pasta looks so good. Um, this uh, ice cream looks so good. This one time, and this one time, and this one time, and this one time. And so the person who, who makes those small, small decisions but they accumulate. And so understanding the accumulation of small decisions against a goal. And that'll be the structure of how some people sabotage themselves constantly because they keep defaulting to, but it looks so good. Yeah, and I, and I found in my own experience, it's interesting because then let's say you make the change, if you've ever made a change before where, um, I don't know, exercising, you don't exercise and then you, I don't want to exercise. And then you start exercising and then you look back and you go, well, of course, you're going to default to exercising now. It's kind of like the decisions are, are um, based on these frames of mind, this information that you have about what you think about how you do things. But when you come out on the other side, you stop smoking and then you go, how could I ever smoke? Or why, why would someone ever smoke? But when you're doing it, you go, I could never stop. And I'm from, so it's, it's interesting how uh, decisions are relative to our perception or relative to our, yes. our frames. So we're getting kind of towards the end here. Do you have um, what would do you have anything you'd like to share with uh, in terms of uh, anything we haven't covered yet, Michael? So here's the psychology of decision making: you cannot not make decisions. <laughs> <laughs> you you make decisions. as a human being. Part of your psychology as an adult is that now you make decisions. You may make decisions against making decisions, <laughs> but that's a decision. So you cannot not make a decision. Given that, we need to focus on how to make great decisions, uh, intelligent decisions, really smart decisions, so that, so that we forge our life. Why make decisions? First of all, for success. 
um, to be effective in whatever you're doing. If, if you don't decide to do something, you probably won't do it. Anything big, magnificent, uh, marvelous, uh, amazing, it takes decision and commitment to make it happen. So if you're going to be effective, if you're going to be successful, uh, success comes to those who know how to make real decisions. So that's the reason why. And sometimes we need to inspire people. You know, so what is something that if there was no fear and nothing holding you back, you would go for? And so we make decisions to be successful. We make decisions to be productive. So sometimes people ask how I, I produce so many books. Well, a decision to write, a decision to gather the information, to put it together, to write seven drafts. Um, it came from a decision. It would not happen without a decision. So efficiency is, is one of the benefits of effective decision making. Um, my decision many, many years ago was to exercise every day. And, so, and I do. I exercise every single day. Uh, there's just hardly a day I, I don't. Um, and so, so effectiveness, success, and efficiency, um, productivity, are two of the main reasons for making executive decisions and therefore achieving something significant. The, the third reason is wisdom. Because we're talking about discerning, discerning values, making distinctions, thinking through things, having quality thinking. And now we can make wise decisions. So the opposite of stupid decisions, poor decisions, sabotaging decisions, is wisdom of making great decisions. And it doesn't come just with age. It comes with thinking through and learning how to commit yourself to the highest and to the best. And that's what we're all about in neurosemantics, the highest meanings, the highest values, the best performance. And that's what we wish for each and every one uh, listening into this. So, so I hope that we, you know, I, I certainly have gotten a lot more intentionality behind becoming a better decision maker and also learned a lot more about the strategy here for myself, as well as the people that I'm communicating with. And, and I, I see how this, I mean, for me, this is just so core to, to neurosemantics. We have the skills to do this. I think if anybody has the skills to make, uh, to make high quality executive decisions, it's, it's us and to, to spread that to other people in the world because I can just see how much that's needed, how much that's needed and how it's not a given that most people just, you're not, nobody's born with it and, and you have to learn how to do it. Well, well, that's, that's us who has that, the, those skills more than anybody. Yeah. So um, yeah, Michael, final, final words as in closing <laughs> here, what's the schedule? Yeah. So, um, almost everybody listening here, you do coaching, you do trainings, you do consulting. Um, and then in your personal life, you make decisions. Um, the world is in need of what we have. When, when we look at the decision making that occurs politically, that occurs in corporations, um, uh, there's a lot of need for high quality decision making. And as Jason just said, we've got the tools. And so I would say, go get them. Michael, I see you're still here. Can I ask you a question? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> meeting after the meeting. You said something that threw me off completely about intuition. Uh, sure. And so... How so? So the intuition and sixth sense and gut feel. What role does that play in decision making? Yeah, most of that's just nonsense. Most of that is just uh, superstitious nonsense. Uh, the studies on intuition. The word in tuition. Tuition is knowing, and in in knowing. 
And when we're born, we know nothing. We don't have language. We don't have thoughts. It takes years and years as we develop in knowing. So the only way anything gets in is through experience and learning. And so, okay. so only the only intuitions that are true is someone who has studied something at least 10 years. Um, if someone is grows up in a dysfunctional family, their intuitions are going to be completely wrong. Although they'll be very how, systematic. How does, that, how does that relate to the kinesthetics? So you know how you like, uh, in my gut, I feel something. My body is telling me something. How, how would that relate to... Well, so once again, it all depends on, on what is the trigger for the kinesthetic. It, it just completely depends upon whether it's... Um, because you can feel the wrong things. I mean, it's, it's, it's not difficult to feel the wrong things. So that's why we got to keep checking uh, back to cognition um, and check the quality of our thinking and, and the quality of our believing uh, to the emotions we're feeling. Um, the emotion is important. It, it is registering. It, it is registering. Um, something, but that something um, may not be accurate, true, ethical. And so um, one of the dangers of, of parenting is teaching uh, children to, that every emotion they feel is legitimate. <laughs> Because they're not. We, we can have lots of false emotions. Uh, Dr. Michael, I have, I have a question. If you okay. <laughs> Just a little. Well, well, what is the, the, the link between uh, part integration and make decision? Part integration and... And make decision. Parts and making decisions, and parts and integrations and making decisions. Exactly. Well, parts integration is that you've got two different um, maps, two different frames, two different beliefs, two different values, and they're in conflict. Um, uh, the old NOP parts integration um, is, a, is a pretty crude way of doing it. Um, because oftentimes you get the two parts and you force them together. And what Bob and I did many years ago was to do a metastates parts integration. So you take the part and you go up to the, the frame that's holding it and the frame that's holding it and the frame, and you keep going until you got a unity frame. And that'll create, that'll be more likely to create integration and alignment than just forcing it at the primary level. Um, so it's, it's really not a decision making process. Um, it's more an integration process. Um, that's the design of it. Thank you. Okay. Um, and Michael, I want to ask one ba very basic question. Uh, <laughs> is, uh, what is definition? The definition, you mean the uh, decision, right? So sometimes because um, all the in, um, uh, executive decision is the combination integration of so many small decision, I think. So many, many small. So when I make a decision to do something, um, uh, you you mentioned sometimes uh, it is it may be the response. So how can I know I'm doing the decision instead of response? It well, if I yeah. if if I asked you the question, or if you asked yourself the question, um, what is the decision I'm acting on? that should flush out if you're just reacting. Yeah. 
Um, it, it, we could also ask the question, um, what's driving this decision? Emotion or value or standard or criteria or context? What's driving the decision? Mm. Um. Um, um, with decision, um, we ha remember that decision is multi-ordinal. So the small everyday decisions is just real small, yeah. and that's level one. Level two decision, so this decision is in service of this one, which mm -hmm. is in service of that one, which mm -hmm. is. So at what level are you making a decision? So. If I if I look around and I, I look at the clock and it and I say oh it's time to go to the gym, mm. well that's a decision, a small decision in service of a larger one. Why 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 are you making that decision? Because I want to be healthy. I've decided I'm going to do exercise every day, and so um, what is that? So at what level are you deciding? So the, one of the problems of deciding, decision-making, is um, uh, we use the same word at all these levels. Mm, yeah. And we don't have different words to indicate higher level. So that's why I've been saying executive decision is at the top. And then there's strategic decisions, um, then there's planning decisions, and there's, there's other decisions along the way. Mm. Yes. Because uh, to me, making decisions, sometimes we need uh, information. We, we, as a major decision, we need a lot of information to search, research something. But finally, maybe, all the information, um, we need to good use of that. Otherwise, we will, yeah, uh, yeah we will make the decision by our emotion, just you mentioned. So yeah. we, we need to know. So it is a, so many levels, matter, matter of the matter levels decision. Yeah. yeah, it makes sense to me. Every decision is about the future. Mm. And the future is unpredictable. I mean, who predicted the virus of 2020. So every decision is about the future. Therefore, every decision is probabilistic. Okay. It, it is probable to a certain degree, more probable, less probable. So what's the likelihood of this happening or that happening? And so another level of decision making is I'm making this decision the probability is 80% chance of success. It's good enough. I'm willing to pay the price. 20%, it may fail. But if I don't make the decision, I'll never know. Now, if it does fail, I've got contingency plan A and B so that it will not be ruinous. It will not ruin my life. So, so many decisions are probabilistic and so get it as this is part of high quality decision making what's the probability and anybody who says 100 percent <laughs> has not thought it through mm. they haven't looked at what could go wrong because mm. because we're we're predicating it on so many things we're predicating it on i'll st i'll be healthy uh uh, I'll have no accidents. I'll have no disease. Um, other people will be healthy. This will not change. Uh, we're just predicating it on so many assumptions. Yes. A another interesting question is all decision before making decision is about, I, I think I make sen making sense. But finally, it's not. So all this, all thing, all thinking in my mind, it seems to me is 
making sense. It, it makes sense. But finally, it's not. So this is the, we need to check the probability by the information. But you know, there are so many fake news now <laughs> in the world, the situation, fake news, yeah? So it depends on what channel, what information we are gather, we are receiving. Yeah. So it, it become more complicated now to make a decision. Yeah. yeah. Mm, thank you. So that's why in the preparation stage, you, you want to be, gathering information and mm. constantly testing it. Mm. What's the source of this information? How reliable is this source? Um, mm. Any so, vested interests that this source may have pushing and nudging it in a certain way. Mm. And We lost Michael. Yeah. I think our time is up. He made a decision, okay. an executive okay. decision. Okay. <laughs> Good one, Jason. Good one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> bye bye. Hey, I, ho I hope I hope you don't have a closure meta program. <laughs> We're gonna be here until six more weeks. <laughs> Michael, Michael made a decision to disappear himself. Make a decision, yeah, it's his decision. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. On closure now. It is non closure. All right. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm going to head out also, okay. I guess. Thank you. Oh, no, they're back. Michael is back. Michael oh, is back. Oh, he's back. back. Oh, he's back. Okay. Yeah. Made another executive decision. Yes. <laughs> Where, where? Uh, let me see. Pin? Yeah, uh, not I pin. Uh, spotlight, perhaps. Ah, uh, they're connecting. Can we for him? Ah, he's back. A decision. Yeah, he's back. You just made a decision. He's did not make this morning was to plug in the computer. Okay, Michael. Thank you. I mean, I think thank for you. the longest, for the where, longest where of time, for the longest of time, I would collect information and I'd, I'd also add my gut feel. <laughs> Got to. Got so to. Yeah. what you just said is to really just uh, it's that's why I said oh it threw me into a spin so I need to read more <laughs> understand more because I've all you know I have this thing of part of how I process information is what what I feel my body is saying <laughs> so I'll add that to whatever else that has been you know how to make a decision so thank you it's, it just brought in my mm. mind I need to read more. Mm. Thank you. So where will we before Michael leave the room? Left the room? Uh, where will we when Michael left the room suddenly? Are we I thought yeah. Michael was answering your question, Mandino? Oh yeah. Before we lost him. <laughs> So we, we know who has the strongest closure meta program is Mariani. <laughs> Finally, you, you are back. <laughs> Finally. Otherwise, you cannot sleep tonight. <laughs> oh, oh. So you, were, you were saying something about the source of the information, how hmm. reliable is it, and... Um, if there's any vested interest into swaying the information a certain way. Yeah, that's where it's so important to get high quality information as best we can and from multiple sources. Um, that helps us to prevent the confirmation bias, availability bias, and some of those other biases in which um, we're, we're making decisions, but uh, we're not really open-minded um, to the information that's out there.
And those those intuitions are they not based on on our prior knowledge, like the 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 information we already have, not necessarily all of the information available. So when we're trusting our intuition based on something, it's only based on the limited information that we've had access to, not necessarily all of the information or the accurate information. So one thing that undermines our decision making are always the black swan, black swan events. A black swan event is an event that was not predict predicted, but could have been predicted. So probably the best example is 9-11, 20 years ago. Um, no one had th even thought of using an airplane as a bomb. But when you think about it, think back on it, yeah, uh, wh why not? But it was a black swan event. Same thing as the virus this past year, a black swan event. It could have been predicted, but nobody predicted it. So black swan events occur actually more often than, than we suspect. Um, it's only when we look back that it makes sense. And then we, we um, reduce the eff effect of it and, and not look forward to what other black swan events could occur. That's where the probability comes in. Hmm. So and ideally, the older we get, the, the better decisions we would make because we have more. Ideally. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so just asking the question of ourselves, what could go wrong? And really uh, looking through the whole, s scanning the whole context, what could go wrong is such a uh, great way of testing um, the, the quality of our decisions. <clears throat> Sounds like a black hey. swan pattern. <laughs> Say again, Anthony. Sounds like a black swan pattern. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like your idea. This is Gada from Lebanon. I like, how are you, Michael and Geraldine? Uh, I liked your idea about the board game, uh, uh, about the meta programs. Are you still thinking about it? Um, it's, it was created many years ago. And it's, we still have, uh, I think we still have about 50, uh, 50 copies of the game. Wow, where in, in, uh, in the States? Um, well, it's available anywhere. Maybe I misunderstood. Is it a book or a board game? It's a board game. Cool. I'll see about it. I'll search about it. <laughs> I like a lot about MetaPro. Mm. So you can order it on, on the neurosemantics.com thing. Yeah. I will see. I will see. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. Uh, here in Lebanon, we call Gada Meta Gada. So her name now is Meta Gada. <laughs> She's always asking out. <laughs> Meta states and uh, <laughs> because, this, because I always ask about when I hear the word meta, let's say meta state, meta something. I ask, well, today you, you, you said meta knowledge, <laughs> and, uh, and this word rang a bell. What is meta knowledge? The knowledge about the knowledge, yeah. So, thank you, Meta Rada. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, dear. I always uh send emails to Dr. Mike and ask him questions and, and he answers me directly. Thanks a lot. Yeah. One thing I did not mention was meta decisions. Uh, a meta decision are the decisions you make about your decision making. 
for instance, I've made a, a meta decision that I'm going to do high quality information gathering before I make a decision. So that's a meta decision. So yeah. your meta decisions govern your decision making powers and abilities. Oh, I have another question. I, <laughs> I, uh, I noticed now that you talk a lot about the layers in everything you layers. But I, I was wondering, you said that you read a lot of books before you write your own book. And this is uh, sure. done always by authors. They read a lot to write their own book. I wondered, what do you do exactly? You read the, the books, what, what for? What do you get from reading the books? Since you have the ideas and the knowledge in your brain and what you, your values and what you want to write about. So what, yeah. do you, what is the kind of nourishment you get from the other books? Oh, well, it's, it's a great question. And those of us who write know that it, it is mostly plagiarism. <laughs> we, call it re we call it research. Yeah. <laughs> I'll call it meta-knowledge. So, copy, copy, paste. <laughs> so, no. so, so I read, and, and like what I've been reading in uh, both decision and metaphor, um, very academic works that have very – and the academics write in such a way that there's no application. So what I want to do is to translate it from the ac academic world and the research world into something practical that can be used. So, so with decision-making, I probably read 50 books. Um, uh, I probably had 20 of them already in my library, and so I reread all of those. And then I started searching for what else has been developed in the last few years, um, different approaches to decision-making, different models, different theories. So um, uh, looking at it from that perspective and then, and then bringing it and putting it through the lens of NLP or the lens of neural semantics. Um, the lens of neural semantics especially is the lens of here's some meaning and here's, here's some practice. And here's that connection between meaning and practice. And so um, uh, the nice thing about reading, and I always try to read at least five or six books of authors that I totally disagree with. So that you that, don't know as you said. Because then they challenge me. Because then I have to think uh, this argument, that argument, and this source of information, that source, and, and seeing if they're if they're using some cognitive fallacies in the way. And so I always read um, people I disagree with in order to refine um, the distinctions and the, and, and the, and the points that I want to make. Um, and, and oftentimes I change my mind. Good. So I'll read. I think yeah, I'll read and I'll change my mind because they made an argument that makes perfect sense, fits into the premises, and I was just wrong. So, um, to me, finding out where I'm wrong is one of the joys of learning. Yes, I feel this too. Thank you very much. Because if I want to ask you and talk to you, I will spend maybe three to four hours. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are lucky. We are lucky to have Michael Lahol. Uh, you know. <laughs> we are lucky. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we are lucky. Thank, we you, thank you. Thank you. We need to end the meeting. Or yes, we have to go ahead. <laughs> 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 thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you, Michael. Come visit, come visit us to Lebanon. Waiting for you to visit us in Lebanon. After the yes. corona. Uh, yes. Lebanon yes, is one of the places Salah. I'd like to go. It's an open invitation whenever. <laughs> and you can also visit him next, uh, uh, this, this year actually in Egypt when he's coming. It's only one hour yeah. from Lebanon to Egypt. Yes, yes. <laughs> Inshallah. Hope yeah. so.
So thank you, everyone, and see you next month. Thank in you. Our thank you. Thank you. For your best decision thank making. You, thank, you. Thank, you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.